thousands of black birds, white birds, all kinds of birds, and they will control these army worms and grasshoppers and things. So we have a lot of things working for us in nature that uh, is quite important. And we've been here for nearly 75 years, so um, we've learned how to uh, work with nature and everything. And we recognize the deer and quail and wildlife are an asset. So we try to take care of it. We don't allow uh, random <coughs> strangers coming in here hunting and that sort of thing. We, we do have some hunting leases. We try to give a man with a lease a five-year lease. And he knows that the deer and stuff in that lease, he considers them his deer. And the young six-point buck, uh, he'll let grow another year and he'll eventually get a trophy buck. And um, when you um, on public lands, why the tendency is, I don't shoot that deer right now, somebody else will. So that's why there's more wildlife on these private ranches. And um, I think that's quite important to the future uh, use of the wildlife and everything is um, is to um, work with a, um, a control hunting thing which keeps your numbers from getting out of hand where they would starve anything. And uh, of course, uh, it's good of you to go with your sons and uh, the people that don't go with their sons, the son gets out 17, 18 years old gets off and gets in an accident or something, and they don't know how to hunt, they don't know how to care for a gun and everything. So what you're doing is quite important. But, um, cattle here, they pay the bills for everything, and we've developed <coughs> new breeds of cattle that are heat tolerant, that will stand the climate down here, and also produce quality beef. And we produce the Brayford by crossing Brema and Hereford. And then uh, these new cattle, they, we call them the AB. They're a half Brayford, a quarter Red Angus, a quarter Gilt Bay. And those cattle, uh, they're, uh, they get through with them while they're choice and prime carcasses. And they grow extremely fast. And the, uh, they are hybridized and the hybrids will grow faster than the purebred anything. And uh, it's uh, been a very interesting thing to see how these cattle work. Do you have any questions about the ranch or anything? How many acres is this ranch? Uh, this ranch is 17,000 acres. Uh, our biggest ranch is in Osceola County of Road 60 up there, it's 33,000. Mm. And we have places in North Florida and Georgia. And uh, the reason we have those places in North Florida and Georgia, our grasses in South Florida tend to be tropical grasses. They're not as nutritious as northern grasses. And uh, in North Florida and Georgia, we grow ryegrass, uh, wheat, oats, and of very high quality feed. So when we wean the calves here, we send them up there on that nutritious uh, program and uh, it allows us to carry more cows here. And uh, we put an additional 300 pounds on our calves up there. Mr. Adams, back in the old days when they were driving cattle, did you, they run cattle from your place all the way down toward Ponte Rossa? Well, when I was a boy, it was in the 1930s, and uh, we didn't have livestock markets then, and we sold our, our cattle to Likes Brothers in Tampa. And we would drive the steers from here to the Kissimmee River. and swim the Kissimmee River, there wasn't a bridge at, um, there at that time, 
and uh, then Lex's crews would pick them up the rest of the way. So we did, we uh, drove cattle overland until um, shortly after World War II. In, in the start of World War II, um, the, the men in their 20s, they were in the Army. And uh, Pete Clemens and I were about 16. And uh, we helped drive cattle from Sebring across this way. And um, uh, we used big crews in of old men and boys. And we got the job done just as good as, as the real cowboys. But then in um, 1944, I went in the Navy. And um, when I came back after the war, why uh, um, there were more highways and fences, and uh, uh, that thing was a thing of the past. I got another one if nobody else does. I got uh, after that last trip here last year, sir. I read that? that after our last trip last year. Yeah. I read that book, A Land Remembered. Oh, yes. Yeah. And I couldn't help but wonder how much of that stuff from the McIvy family may have been from the Adams or the other back in the day, because I know that he took a conglomeration of stories. Yeah. To of weave course, that. It was fiction, but <clears throat> I think it was based primarily on the cattlemen in the Kissimmee River around Kissimmee, the Bronsons, the Partons. Lawrence Silas was a black cowman. That's the only black cowman I ever heard of. And so I suspect that uh, uh, those people were the basis of, uh, of the book. And uh, um, of course it wasn't completely factual, but it, it, gave, it painted a pretty good picture of what those people were up against. It was a difficult, difficult life. And it's always been difficult in the cattle business because uh, cattle prices go up, cattle prices go down. You have to pay your land taxes every year. And uh, if you don't uh, budget carefully and run your business properly, uh, you'll end up losing your land. My three sons principally manage the ranch now, and um, I have eight grandsons and four granddaughters, and there's three of the grandsons and one of the granddaughters that work for the ranch, and so um, they will carry the business along. I'm sure they're, they're very dedicated to their work, and they're smart, and uh, it, um, the difficult thing is paying inheritance taxes as your land values are inflated. Um, land that <coughs> has a limited value for grazing, um, you could sell it for an awful lot of money. And so it's taxed at an awful lot of money. And um, my granddaughter Leanne is uh, working with the state and the federal government to do uh, what we call the agricultural easement, that we will <coughs> sell an easement on a tract of land and we can never build on it or sell it to a developer. Um, land could be sold, but the new buyer would have to honor it. It would be a perpetual easement. So that land would stay in a perpetual cattle ranch forever. And uh, that seems to be the best method that I've seen to preserve this land. And um, this week I met with Secretary of Interior Salazar, Senator Bill Nelson up at Haines City, and they announced the first uh, forming of the uh, uh, Wildlife Reserve. And. Um, they will be part of that on the federal thing. The state program is uh, with the Florida Forever program. And um, there's a possibility that we can have some land in both programs. But they both 
do approximately the same thing. In other words, once we put that easement on it, they will pay us some money which we put in an endowment so that the ranch will have financial means to be taken care of in perpetuity. And then um, um, people here will operate it as a ranch the way it's always been done. And um, we think that's... Uh, and uh, say we put in 10,000 acres there. Uh, that will always be protected. If we hold out some, uh, it won't. It'll be taxed just like it always is. So it kind of uh, depends on how much you want to put into the easement. It's it's strictly a voluntary thing. It's voluntary on the part of the government. It's voluntary on the part of the landowner. We think that's the way it should be. So then that easement perfects, affects the value of the property next to it? Yeah. Because um, they're not going to be able to no. develop next to something that will never be able to Once develop. you put it on this tract of land, it would affect this. But if our neighbor didn't want to do it, um, he would have the rights to sell for development or housing. As less land would be available for housing, his property probably will go up in value. So uh, there's a, a cause and effect to everything, but uh, I don't see this as hurting anybody, and uh, uh, I think it will help the landowners who have uh, uh, children and grandchildren who want to see the ranch continue that way. I think uh, it'll be a wonderful thing for them. Mr. Mr. Adams, do you raise any other stock on any of your properties or grow any agricultural products or are you strictly cattle? We're, we're primarily cattle. On this ranch, we have about 600 acres of citrus and that's a good place to hunt deer. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, our, we're dependent pretty much solely on cattle for the survival of the ranch. And uh, we're the 12th largest cow-calf ranch in America in numbers of cattle. So uh, this, uh, this is a big cattle operation. How many head do you run right now? Well, uh, this ranch, we probably have around 2,000 mother cows. You can double that. You count the calves and the yearlings and everything. On the Lake Marion ranch, we have probably 6,000. And uh, in North Florida, we have several thousand. So uh, altogether, we've got a lot of cattle. But um, say on a place like this, uh, every cow has five acres. So they're not jammed up. It doesn't smell bad. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's an economical operation to run when you, when you get an intensive livestock operation then you have more disease problems, more parasite problems, you have all kinds of problems. And here these cattle, uh, they have plenty of room, uh, the cows eat the grass, they find a bull, they have a calf, they take care of the calf, and uh, uh, it's a pleasure to see the way that these cattle work. It, um, um, They're pretty much free-range cattle then, huh? No. Um, this pasture right in here um, do not co-mingle with any other herd. The ones in here are purebred Brayford cattle, and they're bred to specific bulls, and they don't mix with any other herd. But all of the herds have plenty of room. And the uh, uh, thing that's causing so, so many people concern now is uh, in our area, we probably have a hundred times more automobiles than we had 50 or 60 years ago. All of those use oxygen and, and create carbon. Where does that carbon go? Uh, these ranches, it goes into the leaves of trees, it grows into the grass, and um, it's stored in the bark of, and trunk of the trees, the roots of the trees, and the grass roots. 
and the cattle probably eat half the grass and stomp the other half into the soil. So that carbon is being added to your soil. Uh, we call that organic matter. This was a pretty sandy ranch and um, pretty white sand, but when cattle have grazed here a long period of time, you can dig down and there's a, a, about six inches of topsoil. So um, these ranches are storing your carbon from your cities and your other places. And that's quite important to people that live in these cities and um, uh, the quality of the air. The other big thing that uh, what this thing in, I went to last week in, in, um, in this easement thing was the Everglades and the coastal cities down Palm Beach, Fort Lauderdale, Miami. They have water problems and their water is not good. They don't have enough fresh water and um, so these easements would keep the wetlands kind of in their native state. It would store a lot of water. And you can see on this ranch, uh, our ditches are right up close to the top of the soil. So we're st storing uh, billions of gallons of water in the soil. We also have reservoirs here that store billions of gallons of water. So when it gets um, dry, uh, we can uh, that reservoir of water to uh, grow our grass and water our cows. And then we're fortunate to have good quality artesian water here that we can supplement that with. And uh, uh, have ranches to Mexico and other places, and uh, we're truly blessed here in Florida to have the climate that we have, the soil that we have, the water that we have. On your wells, how deep are your wells? Thousand feet. There are a thousand. Tartesian wells are different as you go into different places. Right. You, uh, uh, our people tell us this is coming from underground rivers that come as far away as Georgia, down through Silver Springs and through the heart of Florida. It's flowing out into the ocean, erupting in freshwater springs out in the ocean. And we're able to tap that water here. We're 24 feet above sea level. Mm -hmm. So if you tap that water, it will come out under considerable pressure and good volume. As you go 10 miles west of here, uh, the land is 50 feet in elevation. saltier than it is here. In fact, on the south side of this ranch, some of our water is too salty for us to use. Right. But right in through here, up through um, St. John's, we have uh, a wonderful uh, artesian water supply. I work for a water utility in Palm Beach County, Palm Beach Gardens. What's I work for a water sewer utility in Palm Beach Gardens, and uh, we're putting, we're going, we're changing our process of water treatment to reverse osmosis, and, uh, and a lot of a lot of utilities down there are yeah, doing you're that. Yeah, we get the salt out of. We, yeah, we're getting we gotta get the salt out, but we got. That's expensive, isn't it? Oh well, yeah, it's, it's, it's multi million dollars, man. <laughs> <laughs> we got to take and get rid of all the salt. We got to send it back down to the earth. Yeah. But and in the long run, it's going to be cheaper because right now we're doing uh, lime softening, and we don't have any place to dispose of lime. Well, yeah, can you? Uh, filter out the salt, then what do you do with the salt? Send it back down. And uh, um, it's a, uh, water will continue to be a problem as uh, more people move to Florida. And uh, the water system for Vero Beach, Port Pierce, and Stewart along the coast, they're on the shallow aquifer right between the Atlantic Ocean and the back country here. And um, if um, they let the backcountry dry up too much and they pump those municipal wells harder, 
they're going to throw in salt intrusion, and they will really uh, be up the creek then. Yeah, well, we are getting salt intrusion. And our so wells are full of salt. The shallow wells right now are, are, are quite good quality. Right. And you can lose that. Y'all have a good, good day and uh, good luck. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you for having us.